Hi, Melanie. Thank you so much for joining us today. So um, I'd like to get right into it and uh, ask our first question. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became involved in animal rights activism? Yeah, um, actually, so I can, you know, talk about what what led me to do the work I do on sure. raising awareness of the psychology of eating animals um, and of relationships and communication. So um, it really evolved out of my own life story. Um, like many people, I grew up with a dog who I loved like a family member. Um, and like most people, I also grew up eating meat, eggs and dairy. And, you know, I just for so many years and so many meals, I, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other, you know, like a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sentient as my dog. Um, I just like, I didn't make the connection. I didn't connect the dots between the meat on my plate or eggs and dairy and the living being it once was. Um, but all that changed in 1989. I was 23 years old and I ate a contaminated hamburger and I wound up hospitalized on intravenous antibiotics um, and was just wildly, wildly ill. And after that experience, I became a vegetarian sort of by accident. It wasn't like I had any kind of conscious awareness of wanting to be vegetarian. I was just like, you know, when you eat something and you get so sick, the last thing that you ate, you never want to eat again. That was what I felt. So, so I became, as I said, like a vegetarian sort of by accident. And of course I had to like learn how to cook for myself and, you know, how to, how to shop and, and, you know, this exploration inevitably led me to information about animal agriculture. And then, you know, what I learned shocked and horrified me. I mean, I just, I, I literally could not wrap my brain around the extent of the suffering of, you know, non-human animals. Um, you know, one day more animals are slaughtered globally than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history um, for the meat, egg, and dairy industry. I, I just could not believe what I was learning. Um, you know, and also the, the extent of harm to the environment. You know, we know that um, animal agriculture is a leading driver of climate change among many other problems. And of of course, you know, I also was shocked by the extent of harm to my own body, um, you know, just the, the, the toll on my own health and human health in general that animal agriculture took or consuming animals. So um, I was shocked and horrified, to say the least. What shocked me in some ways even more than what I was learning, though, was that nobody I talked to about what I was learning was willing to hear what I had to say. Um, I mean, these were like rational, compassionate people like I had been, you know, while I was eating animals all my life. Um, they were my friends and my family members. They were people who loved animals. They were people who were justice minded. They were people who cared about their own health, you know, and yet. Whenever I tried to share what I had learned or what I was learning, the response was almost always something like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. Or they'd call me, you know, a radical, like vegan. I became vegan after, you know, learning about the issues and meeting a vegan, actually. You know, they'd call me a radical vegan hippie propagandist. And so like this wall would go up. And so I just became very curious as to how rational, compassionate people um, could check their critical thinking at the door, could like really participate in irrational, harmful behaviors, you know, without even realizing what they're doing. So this led me to um, study the psychology of, I, I ended up doing a PhD and in my PhD, I studied the psychology broadly, the psychology of violence and nonviolence. Um, I really felt like if I could really understand, you know, what it was psychologically that, you know, drove quote unquote, good people to participate in harmful behaviors. And I could, you know, understand how to sort of you know, work with the psychology and shift it. And I, I focused my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating animals. And that was what led me to identify what I came to call carnism, which is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. And that eventually evolved into my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. Okay, that's great. I think a lot of people who end up being vegans end up with a very similar experience in communicating with their friends and loved ones. So, um, so in your book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear cow, uh, Cows, you discuss the psychology of eating animals, um, why we love some, um, but we 
eat others. Can you talk about this psychology a bit in a little bit more detail and how it relates to relational literacy? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we'll be, you know, talking about some other issues related to relational literacy a bit later on. So we can certainly come to that. Um, and I'll start with the psychology of eating animals. Um, so, you know, I, I think the best way to explain carnism or the psychology that enables carnism, the psychology of carnism is to do through a little thought experiment, right? So let's assume that you're, um, I don't know, let's assume that you're not uh, plant-based and, you know, you eat animals, you eat meat, and you're sitting down and you're biting into a juicy hamburger. And your dining companion turns to you and says, by the way, the meat in that hamburger is not beef. It is made from golden retrievers. Now, chances are what you just thought of as food, you now think of as a dead animal. What you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. And therefore, rather than continuing to eat the hamburger, you probably want to throw it in the trash and maybe even take to the streets in protest. So carnism conditions us to eat certain animals. Basically, carnism teaches us, conditions us to distort our perceptions so that when we look at meat from certain animals, right, um, we see food rather than a dead animal and to disconnect from our natural emotions that would otherwise arise. And therefore, we engage in behaviors that we would probably otherwise never engage in. So carnism is essentially like basically when it comes to edible animals, we learn to stop thinking and feeling. We learn to act against our core moral values of compassion and fairness without even realizing what we're doing. Um, and carnism is, it's its essentially the opposite of veganism, right? We tend to think that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system, right? But the only reason that we learn to eat pigs, but not dogs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. So when eating animals is not a necessity, which is true for many people in the world today, people who can make their food choices freely, then it's a choice and choices always stem from beliefs, but we don't recognize that we have a choice when we're eating animals because most of us grow up believing it's just the way things are. Eating animals is just the way things are. It's the way things are supposed to be. We're never encouraged to pause and ask ourselves if this is something we really believe in, if this is something we really wanna do. So just a couple of other things about carnism that are important to be aware of. Carnism is a special kind of belief system. It's what's called a dominant belief system. That means that its teachings, tenets, are so widespread that they're invisible. They're woven through the fabric of society. They shape norms, beliefs, behaviors, et cetera. Um, and, you know, they, they, they're just woven through the very, you know, the fabric of society and they influence all of our major social institutions, from the family to the state. So for example, when people study nutrition, they're actually studying carnistic nutrition. This carnistic bias is built right into the system, right? But we don't recognize the bias because carnism itself is invisible. Carnism is not only a dominant system, it is also, it's a violent system. Right. It's literally organized around violence. Meat cannot be procured without killing. And of course, egg and dairy, you know, uh, um, production causes extensive harm to animals and to human consumers and so on. Um, and violent systems such as carnism, you could call it an oppressive system such as carnism. Um, most people would never willingly support like most people would never willingly support extensive, intensive and completely unnecessary violence toward non-human animals. That's essentially decimating the planet and sickening our bodies. And so systems such as carnism, they need to use a set of psychological defense mechanisms. These are ways of thinking that distort our perceptions when it comes to those animals we've learned to classify as edible. Carnism essentially teaches us how not to think and feel. So I'll give you a couple of examples of these defense mechanisms that I'm talking about so they're not an abstraction. Sure. Um, and one of them, go ahead. Did you want to ask something? No, no. So I, was, I was saying, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, um, you know, so one defense is the name doesn't matter. De-individualization. So we learn to think of farmed animals as abstractions, as lacking any individuality or any personality of their own. We learn to believe that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. We also learn to think of farmed animals as objects. So when we look at the chicken on our plate, you know, we refer to that as something 
rather than someone. These are distancing mechanisms. They distance us psychologically and emotionally from the truth of our experience. Um, Another uh, defense mechanism is justification, right? And the way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of eating animals, the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy um, are the facts of eating animals. There's this vast mythology surrounding eating animals that we all learn to believe is is our truths when they're actually fictions, right? All of these myths fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, these same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history from male dominance to heterosexual supremacy. So what happens to all of us, though, is that we're all born in, whether whether you know we want to be or not, we're all born in because car- to this system because carnism is dominant. It's widespread. And so we all internalize carnism. We all learn to look at the world through the lens, through the eyes of carnism. We all internalize these defenses, these defensive ways of thinking. And, you know, carnism causes us to feel defensive, to keep itself alive against anyone or anything that would help get us out of the carnistic box. So very often when somebody is advocating plant-based eating or advocating veganism, whatever, you know, they experience this wall going up. It's just like, don't, don't talk to me. Don't tell me that, you know, and then you're immediately made to be wrong, right? You challenge the dominant carnistic bias and you're called biased, biased yourself. You know, you express concern or sensitivity around what's happening to the animals, the environment, our own bodies. And all of a sudden, you know, you're an overly emotional, therefore not rational, sentimentalist animal lover, right? These are ways of shutting down the conversation. And, you know, when you think about it, first of all, this argument that people who are advocating, you know, that are that are advocating for more sensitivity um, has been used to discredit and silence the voices of people who have challenged dominant violent systems throughout history, you know, the suffragettes were called hysterical, people who were, you know, again, working to abolish African slavery were considered sentimentalists. And it is a form of shoot the messenger. If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. Somebody who's, you know, overly emotional, by definition, is irrational. And somebody who's irrational is not worth being, you know, not worth being listened to. But When you think about it, the emotions of grief and horror, um, you know, that we may feel when we become aware of what can only be called a global catastrophe, a global atrocity, these are actually normal, healthful, legitimate emotional responses to the atrocity that we're aware of. You know, much, much more concerning psychologically is the widespread numbing of the dominant culture. So carnism, to sum up, Carnism uses a very set of, you know, sophisticated psychological defenses that we all inherit and we all internalize in order to keep itself alive and to maintain itself. And so many people who become vegan, who become plant-based, feel just incredibly frustrated and can very easily end up despairing because this defensiveness is internalized among the people around them. And they find that suddenly their relationships and communication start to break down and that they they, they can't find a way forward in, you know, trying to connect with others. Great. Thank you for that answer. So, um, so why do vegans and non-vegans struggle with relationships and communication? Well, um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, one reason is because vegans and non-vegans are people and people struggle with relationships <laughs> and communication, right? So it doesn't matter who you are. Most of us have never gotten a single formal lesson when you think about it, right? Most of us have to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use. And yet we don't get a single formal lesson in how to be healthy relational beings and how to communicate effectively. And when you think of some of the most pressing problems in the world, these are not caused by people who don't know how to do geometry. So most of us stumble through our relationships and do the best we can with what we have. And that what we have is what we learned from our parents who are generally not the best role models for most of us, um, you know, from the dominant culture, from Hollywood. And, you know, so people struggle in relationships and communication. On top of this, however, 
whenever there's like a, a fairly significant ideological, um, you know, or lifestyle difference, that makes it very difficult for people, even more difficult for people to relate across the difference. And then when we're talking about this difference with carnism and veganism, that complicates things even further. I've just been talking about carnism and, you know, as you may imagine, Say you have somebody who stepped outside of the carnistic box, you know, and mindset, and now they're plant-based or vegan, um, and they're trying to relate to somebody who's internalized this defensiveness against their very way of being, that's not easy, you know? And then on top of it, many people, many, many people who are no longer participating in carnism, who are vegan, who are, you know, eating a plant-based diet, um, have also developed a particular psychology, a reactive psychology. It's a psychology, I call it reactive vegan, so if I can pronounce it, reactive vegan psychology. It's a reaction to the living in the dominant carnistic culture. So when you're awake to this, you know, the atrocity that is carnism, you, your whole life, can, can really change. And, you know, whether you're sort of motivated to not eat animals for more ideological, you know, or philosophical reasons, and you call yourself a vegan, or you're just following, a, you know, I don't want to say just, but you're, or you're following a plant-based diet and lifestyle, you know, and you're not really that ideologically oriented, you can still end up having very similar experiences. You become a part of a a small minority, you know, of the population. And, um, you know, the way that I say it, try to describe it is it's, you know, feminists in the 1970s said, we don't see different things. We see the same things differently. And, you know, once you step out of this carnistic mindset, you're seeing the same things differently. You're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner with your family and there's a turkey on the table that you may have, you know, once celebrated with them. And all of a sudden there's a carcass in front of you. And all you can do is try to stop the images from of horrific animal suffering from coming into your mind or, all you can do is like try not to think about the fact that your uncle Bob has already had two open heart surgeries and now is like digging into, you know, the lemon meringue pie. Um, it, it's kind of crazy making, you know, when when you wake up and you, you start to look around and you see this atrocity happening and you see the consequences of it and everybody around you is, you know, you're, you're working to clean up the mess made by others and everybody around you is acting like something's wrong with you, um, you know, because because you care, because you're basically following the values that everybody supposedly shares with you, you know, so it, it can be very difficult um, to, to relate across this difference because, you know, on one hand, you've got the carnistic mentality that's creating defensiveness against the vegan. And then you've got the reactive vegan psychology, whereby there is, um, you know, very often we have seen graphic images of animal suffering, um, you know, and that can be very triggering for people, very upsetting for people. Very often we're looking at people in our families who we know are sick or we fear are sick and they don't want to hear anything we have to say and they're calling us biased. Um, and, and that can be very, very difficult. And so the good news is that there's a way around this, you know, because we we see each other as the enemy. And really, you know, it's about shifting perspectives so that we recognize that in a relationship, you know, and I'm not just talking about an intimate relationship, any relationship, in a relationship where one person eats animals and the other person does not, you know, we can say this is not just a relationship of two, it's a relationship of three. And the third element in that relationship, what we call in psychology, triangulating that relationship is carnism. You know, you're in a relationship with this invisible entity that is carnism. You can't see it, but it is profoundly influencing the way that you think about each other and the way that you interact with each other. And with a shift of perspective, you can say, you know what, you and I are gonna become allies against carnism. We don't need carnism to create us, to, to make us feel like opponents with one another. And in, in my book, Beyond Beliefs, which is a guide to improving relationships and communication um, among vegans, vegetarians, and, and meat eaters, um, I, I talk about ways to do this. And, and one important step is like really learning about carnism and this psychology. And then also learning about reactive vegan psychology and the ways that we've been conditioned to think so that we end up fighting with each other rather than, you know, working together to create a more harmonious relationship. Okay. Thank you so much for that answer. So in your book, Beyond Beliefs, A Guide to Improving Relationships and Communication for Vegans, Vegetarians, and Meat Eaters, you explain that building relational literacy, which I feel like you're kind of touching on in this, in this conversation, is essential for not only bridging vegan and non-vegan differences, 
but also for personal growth, the health of our relationships, and also for social and ecological transformation. What exactly is relational literacy? And to the extent that you, you know, that you haven't touched on all of it, um, why is it so important? Yeah, absolutely. So relational literacy is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating. And it is one of the single most important and transformational, building relational literacy is one of the single most important and transformational um, undertakings any of us can embark on. And it can completely change your life and certainly can really change your relationships. And, you know, as I said before, most people never learn to, to relate in a way that's healthy. So when we build relational literacy, all of our relationships, including our relationship with ourselves, can change dramatically. I mean, we're, we're always relating to ourselves, right, through our self-talk. I mean, if you pause, you'll notice that you have an inner voice that's always talking to you. And most of us talk to ourselves in ways we would never tolerate coming from other people. And there's been a lot of research on this and changing that self-talk can change your life. Um, you know, so that you have a healthy relationship with yourself. We relate to ourselves through, you know, the choices that we make that impact our future selves, you know, our five minutes from now selves or our five years from now selves. Um, we're, we're always relating. We're always in relationship. And when we don't know the principles and practices for relating in ways that are healthy, we're at a, an incredible disadvantage. And, you know, when you think about it, some of the most pressing problems, not only in our personal lives, but also in our world, right? War, poverty, animal exploitation, climate change, you know, patriarchy, racism, um, it could go on and on. You know, these problems really share a common denominator. All of them share this common denominator. That common denominator is relational dysfunction. It's dysfunctional or problematic ways of relating between social groups, between individuals, between humans and non-human animals, between humans and the environment, and of course, between us and ourselves. What this means is that learning to relate in a way that's healthy, which is learning to build relational literacy, is also a common denominator in helping transform all of these all of these problems. And, you know, Relational literacy is, is based on many principles and practices, a lot of tools that go into it, but anybody who wants to learn to build relational literacy can. Um, I, I have a book, I wrote a book called Getting Relationships Right, which is a one-stop guide to building relational literacy. And, and frankly, if you, if a person improves their, their relational literacy by just 5%, even that can transform their lives. So when we learn to relate in a way that's healthy, we can relate across differences. We can have conversations across differences. We can navigate problems in a completely different way um, than we had before. Great, thank you. So you mentioned that rational literacy, like in your in your writing, you mentioned that uh, rational, excuse me, relational literacy is based on a simple formula that can be applied to pretty much every kind of relationship. What is that formula? Yeah, so relational literacy is like, as I said, it's it's made up of like a lot of different components, a lot of principles and practices, but they, they're they all based on what I call the formula for healthy relating. And so this formula can be applied to, you know, brief interactions or to long-term relationships, right? Relationships are really just a series of interactions, you know, and the, the formula applies to our communication, of course, Communication is the primary way we re actually relate. Um, the formula applies to how we relate to other animals as well as to the environment. And, and here's the formula. In a, in a healthy interaction, communication, whatever, you know, in a healthy interaction, we practice integrity and we honor dignity. I'll unpack this so it's not abstract. Sure. Practice integrity and we honor dignity. And in so doing, this leads us to feel more secure, and connected. So I'm going to repeat that and then unpack it. You practice integrity and you honor the other person's dignity or your own, if you're relating to yourself, and that creates a sense of security and connection. So practicing integrity, integrity is simply the integration of our core moral values and our behaviors, right? And the two universal core moral values that are espoused across cultures most, most, most commonly are compassion, which is caring, and justice, which is fairness. Justice, treating others the way, you know, essentially to really sum it up, right? Practicing integrity is treating others the way you would want to be treated if you were in their position. It's practicing respect. So honoring dignity is 
thinking of and treating, so dignity is in your mind as well as your behavior, treating someone else as no less worthy of being treated with respect or of occupying, occupying space on the planet than you or anyone else. So when you honor dignity, you basically say you have fundamental worth as a being. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you look like, you have inherent worth and you deserve to be treated with respect. This doesn't mean we don't have, hold people accountable. You know, we just honor their dignity in the process of holding them accountable. When you practice integrity and honor dignity, this creates a sense of security and connection, right? And and in like, let's pause for a second. If you think about a relationship in your own life and you think about a relationship that's a pretty good relationship, maybe a great relationship, chances are really high that you trust that other person really treats you with respect. They practice their integrity towards you. Chances are that you feel like they honor your dignity. They don't see you as less than in some way, um, less worthy of being treated with respect. And chances are you feel pretty secure and connected with them when you interact with them and in general in the relationship with them. And this formula, like most things in life, is not either or, it's, it exists on a spectrum, right? So uh, interaction or relationship, it's not that it's healthy or unhealthy, it's that it's more or less so, right? So the on the other side of the spectrum, you know, are dysfunctional behaviors and a dysfunctional, or I call them non-relational behaviors. Uh, they're the opposite, you know, in a dysfunctional or non-relational interaction, you violate integrity and harm dignity. And this creates a sense of insecurity and disconnection. And again, if you think about a relationship in your own life, maybe you haven't even met the person, maybe it's with like an online troll or something. Chances are you feel like they don't practice integrity towards you. They violate their integrity towards you. Chances are you feel like they perceive you as somehow less than, less worthy of being treated with respect. And chances are you feel disconnected from them and insecure with them. So the beautiful thing about this formula is that we can come back to that. We come back to it at any moment in time. You know, we can pause and ask ourselves, we're in a difficult interaction. Am I practicing the formula? Or do I feel like this other individual is practicing the formula toward myself? One of the great things about building relational literacy is not just that we can be kinder people and, you know, more effective in our communications, but we can also protect ourselves from relational harm. Because so often we end up being accepting unfair treatment or, or unhealthy treatment because we can't quite put our finger on what's wrong. You know, you just kind of come out of an interaction or you have a, a relationship with a colleague and you just feel kind of lousy but you, you don't know exactly what it is that's going wrong. You know, when you're more relationally literate, you can put your finger on it and you can say, oh, that person's not practicing the formula for me. They're, they're using this, such and such a technique when they're interacting with me or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the formula that it underlies, you know, relational literacy. Can you give me an example of how you would actually put that in place with somebody who perhaps is disrespecting you or like you're in an interaction, you know, let's if we go back to the vegan versus non-vegan and it, it has devolved into something acrimonious, how do you take that formula and put it into effect? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and you would put it into practice and it, it, I mean, it really depends on the situation, you know, al allowing like preventing others from disrespecting you is practicing the formula, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can, because allowing people to treat you badly is allowing them to violate their integrity. I and mean, it's, it's, and it's also violating your, your, you know, harming your dignity. So it really depends on the situation. Um, but when you speak your truth, honestly, and with compassion, you know, and you say, say, for example, you know, you're having an argument with a non-vegan, right. And this person is telling you, um, let me think of a good, uh, a common example. Oh, you know, you're sitting at the dinner table and there's a carcass in the center of the table. And you say, you know, I would really appreciate it if we could put this in the other room. And cause it's like, it's, I, you know, I don't want to look at it. 
and the person says something to you like, oh my God, here you go again. You're just so overly sensitive and like expecting us to accommodate your every need, you know, whatever. Um, you can say, and by the way, I mean, I would recommend having one ally at that dinner table with you before you even start the dinner, but that's another, another story. So you could say something like you speak your truth, like you tell your truth as your experience and your story, not this is what you should do. This is what you think, you know, this is how you should change. Nobody can make your story wrong. And you can share very openly if it's a safe situation for you to be open in. Listen, I, under, I understand why it seems like I'm, I'm having an overreaction to you. I understand why it seems that way. Let me just share what I see, you know, in the past, this was not a problem for me. I used to be able to look at the turkey and feel appetized like you do. It's just that I have seen so many horrible videos and images of, you know, what happens to the animals that become our food, that when I look at the turkey on the table, no matter how hard I try, I cannot help but have these images of, of horrible images of these animals suffering. They just jump into my mind. And it's really so painful for me. I don't know how to describe it. I, it's Maybe it's the way that you would feel if it were the carcass of a dog on the table. Um, this is just my experience. So it's really hard for me. And having it in the other room, I would really appreciate it, right? I mean, sometimes that'll work, sometimes it won't. But, um, but what I'm demonstrating is that you're not saying this is how you should be. What you're saying is this is what my experience is. And this is what I would really appreciate. Okay, great. Thank you. You may have saved some Thanksgiving dinners from going south with uh, with those tools. So um, you say that the same mentality that causes us to relate to people in a dysfunctional way that leads to harm and disconnection causes us to relate to animals in a dysfunctional way. And also that this mentality is contagious. Can you explain these points? Yeah, so carnism is... It's an ism. It's um, and it's a badism. It's a it's a non-relational system. Carnism is essentially a system of, of oppression. It is structured in in the same way. And this is what one of my the focuses of my doctoral dissertation was like. You know, looking at the structure, identifying the system, and then deconstructing it. Looking at the structure of it. Carnism is structured in the same way that other problematic or oppressive systems are. You know, like patriarchy or classism, racism, spe speciesism, and so on. And all of these systems stem from the very same mentality. I call this the non-relational mentality. The non-relational mentality is a way of thinking that drives, you know, the way that we think tends to drive the way that we feel and the way that we behave. The non-relational non mentality is a way of thinking that drives us to act against the formula essentially, to violate integ integrity and, and harm dignity, and it leads to insecurity and disconnection. And when it comes to these systems, it also leads to unjust power imbalances or it feeds unjust power imbalances. So this mentality is, the core of this mentality is a belief. And this is what I call the belief in a hierarchy of moral worth. And I'll unpack this. This is the belief that some individuals are more worthy of moral consideration, being treated with respect, essentially, than others. If you look at all injustices, you know, all unjust systems, whether it's these massive social systems that we were just talking about or smaller systems, you know, systems are basically, it's another word for relationships, right? A system could be a relationship of two people or it could be multiple relationships like a social system or a workplace um, or, or a group. Um, so this belief in a hierarchy of moral worth that some individuals are more worthy of being treated with respect than others, it lies at the heart of all systems that are organized around unjust uh, injustice, right? Whether that's an abusive interpersonal relationship or a dysfunctional toxic workplace or a broader social system. There's this belief that I or we, my group, has the right to treat you as less than. I see you and treat you as less worthy of being treated with respect than I am or than my group is. So we can just, you know, the content of these systems changes. The content is the what 
you know, who is oppressing or abusing whom changes. Men and women, people of other genders, for example, humans and animals, for example, the content changes, but the process, how we think about the others and ourselves, it remains consistent. It's not enough to only look at who is oppressing or abusing whom when we look at big social problems. We have to ask how and why we oppress or abuse in the first place. Otherwise, we're never we're just going to keep trading one form of oppression for another. You know, you can see people who are like really active in social justice, for instance, and yet animals never factor into the equation. And, and yet the very same mentality that causes us to, to, to cause such horrific harm to the animals is causing us to cause a horrific harm to humans. And then you see a lot of people who are, you know, they'd give their lives for animals and yet they're throwing humans under the bus in the process, you know, or somebody who seems to have it all together because they're working for a better world for animals, humans, and the environment. And yet they're treating their friends and family badly. It's, the same mentality is the non-relational mentality that causes us to feel somehow morally superior to others, that we have a right to treat someone else, you know, in a way that harms their dignity, whether that someone else is the pig in a slaughterhouse or that someone else is, you know, a person in our close inner circle or somebody online who we disagree with politically. This, this is the problem. It's this way of thinking and relating. And so when this is one of the things, one of the reasons it's so important, in my opinion, to understand the formula, recognize the formula and build relational literacy, because when we build relational literacy, we help to transform all of these problems. Um, you know, and we're more effective in working to transform these problems Many of us, you know, myself included, we're working in, you know, what are called counter systems. These are systems like veganism, right? Feminism. They, they were organized to challenge oppression. And yet we can see these are our groups and our move, movements that are structured to try to end a particular form of injustice or of oppression. And within these groups and these movements, we're kind of cannibalizing ourselves because we're acting out the same kind of non-relational mentality toward others. Like, oh, you know, should you say plant-based or should you say vegan? Um, wait a minute, I saw you put milk in your coffee this morning, you can't call yourself a vegan. I mean, the, the infighting, you know, that you see in so many different groups and movements is like, it's astounding. The levels of infighting, you know, they're, they're very, very high, which is not surprising because people are people. And most of us have learned that when we have a difference of opinion from somebody else, we need to kind of push them and fight with them in order to get them to agree with us. So learning the formula, however, and building relational literacy will help all of us who are working to create a, a better world for everyone do so much more effectively. Um, we actually have a new project that we're going to be launching in, in a few weeks. At it, people can visit infighting.org if they want to learn how to end infighting, about how to end infighting. Yeah, that's actually very helpful. I, I have been a part of some uh, vegan communities, and it's astounding the amount of, of sabotage in, bet you know, in between people for various reasons, and that infighting can really be disruptive to the ultimate goal. So... When you talk about vegan supporters, what is a vegan supporter and why is this subject important? Yeah, a vegan supporter is somebody who supports veganism and vegans, right? Even though they're not vegan themselves and or not fully vegan themselves. So we, we, we tend to assume those of us who are vegan, you know, tend to assume either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. And, you know, the problem with this way of thinking I mean, there are problems with this way of thinking, but the big problem with this of this way of with this way of thinking is that it prevents like 99% of the population from supporting a cause that needs all the help it can get. Mm -hmm. There are many people who, you know, actually believe in the tenets of veganism. And, you know, this is even in recent years, as veganism has gained in popularity. Like, you know, when I first became vegan, my people were like, you know, they looked at me like I had two heads, like what's wrong with you? Um, and now it's like, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, that's why you look so young. I wish I could do that. Good for you. I could never do that, but good for you. And it's like, people get it, you know, they support it by and large. And, you know, if we say, but you're not vegan, so forget it. Um, we, we really push away support that we need. We need all the support we can get. And 
Some of the people who have done, in my experience, uh, the most for the cause are not vegan. They're not even vegetarian. You know, they are people I've been, I, I've given like talks or trainings um, about this issue all over the world. I've been in over 50 countries and six continents and generally get pretty good international press when I'm traveling. And consistently, I, I, I have like big media that I'm talking to and the people interviewing me frequently say, oh, I'm so glad I got to interview you. I know this is such a terrible problem. And I love the fact that I can do my part by raising awareness. And I'm like, you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, this is like just on a, on a purely practical level, on the level of impact. This does more good for the cause, you know, than somebody simply not eating animals for their entire life, you know, especially if that person who's not eating animals is communicating in a way that's counterproductive and might even be turning people off to the cause. So, so really we need to be inviting in supporters, you know, saying like, you're great, you're a doctor and you're not vegan, but you're supportive of plant-based nutrition. That's fantastic, you know, or, or a dietitian. Um, and uh, yeah, invite, invite people in to use their influence in whatever way they can to support the cause. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, so in, in some of your work, you touch on, uh, on secondary traumatic stress. Um, how does it impact vegans and their relationships? So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier where I, I talked about how many people, um, you know, whether sort of somebody who identifies as vegan or as following a plant-based lifestyle, we, we kind of, we get the same feeds. Like a lot of the time we're sort of like plugged into the same social media or similar social media channels. And we often end up seeing um, the trauma, like the, witnessing graphic animal suffering basically. And, um, and this can be traumatizing. So secondary traumatic stress is a post-traumatic stress response. It's actually exactly like PTSD. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder with one key difference, which is that it affects the witnesses to violence rather than the um, direct victims of violence. And so many people who are vegan are, are have suffered from some sort of traumatization and, you know, some substantially. And you do not have to be somebody who's going undercover to have been traumatized from what you've been witnessing is a, is a normal human response to, to witnessing this kind of trauma. I mean, carnism is a global atrocity. As I said, it's by definition, it's a mass traumatic event. What happens, however, is that when we're traumatized and we don't know it and we don't know how to take care of ourselves, we can end up developing a whole host of problems. And um, and I see this, I have seen this all over the world that I've gone, um, where we, for example, um, you know, we can start becoming misanthropic, which is having a dislike for humankind. We can start feeling profound despair. We can start feeling guilty for feeling good. We can start feeling like, you know, our efforts are never enough and, and they are never enough to bring about animal liberation, obviously, but that's not what I'm talking about. At the end of the day, it's never enough. And, and people get into compulsive overworking, which then can lead to burnout. Um, and we can develop, um, we, we become dysregulated more easily dysregulation or what's called emotional dysregulation it's being emotionally out of balance it's generally when your emotions are there's a charge around your emotions and you struggle to manage them you can have chronic dysregulation you know everybody knows what dysregulation is because we're all we get dysregulated all the time you know something bad happens and like, oh my god you you feel dysregulated your heart's racing you could be angry you could be in grief you know um so, and, and when we have secondary traumatic stress, you know, we can become chronically dysregulated and, um, you know, and that's, that's a problem for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that dysregulation, you know, is contagious. Non-relational behaviors are contagious essentially. And when we're dysregulated, we're more likely to dysregulate others. So for example, somebody who's like really charged up, you know, short fuse, kind of intense, anger underneath the surface, anger coming up, you know, you interact with them. It doesn't take long for you to start feeling a little dysregulated yourself and saying things that then dysregulate others. So we have to be, um, it, it's important to be mindful of secondary traumatic stress. And, and, and one piece of this that's important to be, particularly important to be mindful of is that when we're traumatized, we can start to develop 
a worldview. I call this the trauma narrative. It's a way of thinking, a way of seeing, essentially, a way of thinking, whereby we start to put everybody, including ourselves, into one of three categories. You're either a victim, and if you're not a victim, you're a perpetrator. And if you're not a perpetrator, a victim, you're a hero. A lot of people will say, oh, you're a witness, but a witness can actually be a witness perpetrator if they don't help or a witness hero if they do. So it's really, it's victim, perpetrator, and, and hero. So what happens is we start to place everyone in one of these roles when we get traumatized enough. So it's like, you're good, you're bad. You're not an animal hanging in a slaughterhouse. And you know when we have these sort of rigid categories, we become perfectionistic around them. We don't see any wiggle room. Like the reality is that we all play all roles, like, right? So you're a vegan and maybe you're playing the hero role because you're helping to end the atrocity, but you're also victimized by carnism because you live in a world that daily affronts, you know, your deepest sensibilities and you're probably mocked and ridiculed and dealing with secondary trauma, you know, and you're also a perpetrator because we all are, you know, we're all participating in the problem in one way or another. It's impossible not to, it's impossible to live perfectly in alignment with our ideals in such a messy, complicated, messed up world. You know, your, your vegan shoes have horse glue in the heels of them or something. I mean, who knows? But what the problem is, when we put everyone, including ourselves, into one of these categories, we start to hold everyone, including ourselves, to impossible standards. You know, one slip up, one like, oh, I was traveling and I ate something with cheese that had casein in it, vegan cheese that had casein in it. Um, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, if you're not a hero, because heroes are all good all the time, then you're a perpetrator. And you can see this in, you know, with vegans talking about other vegans, you know, asking if so-and-so is a real vegan and calling people out for, you know, what they are or aren't doing enough. So we have to be really careful um, because this mentality, it fuels infighting. It makes us, it makes it very hard for us to advocate effectively about veganism to non-vegans because we come across in a way that's, you know, not terribly attractive and it hurts us. And so, you know, the key is awareness. Um, you know, I have in Beyond Beliefs, I have a lot of information about this. We we have, I'll, I'll give you some resources at the end of this uh, session, but uh, the key is really is building awareness and, and learning about this issue. And like, there are three things that you can do. Everybody can do right now if you want to prevent further secondary traumatic stress and manage what you have now and, and, and help heal it. One is to not overwitness. Stop looking at the graphic pictures. Stop. They come through your feed. Turn it off. Like you don't need to take it all in. There's there's a strange compulsive quasi addictive flavor to this horrible imagery where people start to feel like they can't look away and. If we had another couple of hours, I'd talk about that, but we don't, so I won't. Just know that that happens. Um, stop taking it in. Every time you take in more of this, you're feeding your trauma. You don't need to be traumatized to be a part of the solution. In fact, the more traumatized you are, the less able you are to be an effective part of the solution. Give yourself permission to let the trauma go and to stop witnessing. That's one thing. Do not make others unintentional witnesses. Don't shock people with horrific imagery. Um, because that is a form of emotional violence that can traumatize people and they will immediately perceive you as a perpetrator because you shocked them and it hurt them. And they're going to direct their anger at you rather than where it actually should be directed, which is a system. That's the problem, you know, animal agribusiness. Um, so, I mean, we need to be able to raise awareness. There's no question. We need to be able to show this information. There's no question, but how we do that determines on how determines how successful we are and getting somebody's consent there are lots of ways to do this is practicing the formula and reducing the chances of a backlash and the third thing to do is to practice really really healthy good self care do what you need to to practice the formula toward yourself and as part of your self care foster healthy relationships. You know, people who have strong relational connections um, are less likely to be traumatized and, and more likely to heal from the trauma that they have experienced. Okay. Excellent. Excellent advice. So um, what are some of the key tips that you can share about effective communication are, beyond what you just said? 
Well, um, I'll give one one tip actually sure. for effective communication. So it's um, most of it. So so all communication is made up of two components: the the content, which is what we're talking about, right, um, and the process, which is how we're communicating. Most of us overfocus on the content and underfocus on the process. We just want to get the words perfectly right. We want to get our facts perfectly straight. However. Studies have shown the process matters more, much more, in fact. So, for example, if you think about a conversation you had maybe at a dinner party or something, I don't know, like six months ago or a year ago or five years ago, uh, there's a good chance that you don't remember any of the content. Like, you don't even remember what you were talking about, but you probably still remember how you felt in the conversation. The process determines how you feel. So when your process is healthy, you can talk about anything without arguing. And when your process is not healthy, you can't talk about anything without arguing. Um, a healthy process is based on the formula, not surprisingly. Um, in a healthy process, our goal is not to win, which means to make the other person lose. And it's not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. Our goal is mutual understanding. The only reason we use communication in the first place is because we're not mind readers. That's it. The goal of communication, the, the, the objective of communication is for the other person to know, understand what you're thinking and feeling and for you to understand what the other person's thinking and feeling and maybe needing. So when you, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't talk beyond that, like you can't have something that you want to, you know, an outcome that you hope for, for the conversation. But the very first, most important step has to be mutual understanding. So I'm sharing my truth with you. I'm not telling you what's true for you. I'm not telling you what you should be doing. Here's what's true for me. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. Maybe this is what I need. And I want to listen to yours as well, as long as you communicate in a way that's respectful. So so this one tip is to be more process focused. And if you're more process focused, everything else will become a lot easier in your communication. There are many, many, many like very specific tools that you can use as well. Um, the debate model is usually not effective. Um, there are certain situations where the debate model makes sense, you know, in, you know, political, when people are running for office, for instance, or um, in a courtroom. Apart from very few like exceptions, the debate model is usually counterproductive. So if you notice that you're starting to debate somebody, that you're starting to like kind of push your truth on them um, rather than sharing the truth of your experience, you're trying to like make them lose and convince them of the rightness of your position. That's a red flag that, you know, you're probably um, not communicating in a way that's as effective as, as you could be. And when you invite somebody into a debate with you, you're basically inviting them to come up with all the reasons as to why their position is wrong and or right. And in the end of the conversation, they can end up, and studies have shown this, they can end up even more convinced of their position. So discuss rather than debate, you know, have a healthy process. Okay, excellent. So um, your book, Beyond Beliefs, has appendices that are that are scripts readers can use to talk about veganism and their needs with and their needs with non-vegans. Why do you include these? Uh, it can be really hard to, to start to, to try to have these conversations, you know, where you're asking somebody to be a vegan supporter or sometimes I say a vegan ally. Um, or where you're saying, you know, this is what the world looks like through my eyes. And one of the appendices is, a, is like a letter to a non-vegan in your life. You can just there photocopy them and change up the words however you want and and use them. But it, it, they're a starting point because these conversations can be quite difficult and challenging to have. Um, we also, after the book was published, my organization Beyond Carnism, we, we um, published a video we produced a video called What to Say to Vegans. And this is a seven minute video. Uh, it's on our website, carnism.org, right on the homepage, um, What to Say to Vegans. And this is a seven minute video um, that is basically what the world looks like through vegan eyes uh, to invite non-vegans into your world. And, you know, a lot of vegans find um, very, very often vegans struggle in their relationships, particularly their closer relationships, because 
Um, they're trying so hard to get the people in their lives to become vegan. And it's like, you go vegan, you become vegan. And all of a sudden there's this like, you know, it gets so hard and there's this defensiveness. And then it's like, oh my God, how can I respect you? Look at what you're doing. Like, how, how can you be doing this? And it can be very painful because people feel vegans automatically start to feel disrespected from the people in their lives. And we're, we all seek connection with others, healthy connections with others. So, you know, and then vegans understandably think, well, the way to solve this problem of feeling so disconnected is just turn everybody around me vegan. Then we won't have the disconnection anymore, except the harder you try to turn people around you vegan, usually the harder they push back and the greater the disconnection. And it just becomes this like feedback loop. And very often what vegans find is that they don't need the people in their lives to be vegan. They need them to be vegan supporters, you know, or a, an, a, another way to say this is an ally. Everyone, you know, particularly in the closer relationships, we all need to know that those who, with whom we're in relationship really understand and respect our inner world. Everybody needs to know this, like whether it's about veganism or something else. And it's very painful for vegans who very often end up feeling like I can't share something that's so deeply within me. Some of the things that give me the greatest joy and cause me the greatest sorrow. I can't share that with you. And not only can I not share that with you, but you're 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 looking down on me, you know. So, but but what what vegans can do is to say instead of go vegan, I need you to become vegan. I'm going to give you all the reasons why you should be vegan, which, as I said, often doesn't work. Is to simply say, listen, I would love to be able to share information about veganism with you, not to turn you vegan, but so you understand me. This is so fundamental to who and how I am in the world today. It's so important to me. And if you don't understand what this core belief that I carry around is based on and, you know, and, and how I see the world, you're never really going to understand me. And there's a really good chance that you're going to be doing things that are going to be deeply offensive to me without even intending to. And, and in this way, you share the information and very, very often people find, and, and by the way, that's a very reasonable request and a very healthy request to make of somebody. Requesting that somebody change their diet is crossing a boundary, you know, and many people get defensive. Don't tell, I'm, in a, I'm a grown up, don't tell me what to eat, you know, but if you're in relationship with somebody, it is a completely rational and relationally healthy request to say, I need you to understand me. And in order for you to understand me, I need to share this with you. Um, and whether it's veganism or anything else, you know, Catholicism or whatever. So it, it's very often what vegans find is that when somebody gets it and they become a supporter and they say, look, I'm still not there yet. I still, I, maybe I'll never be there, but you know what? Good for you. I see, I see your compassion. I honor your compassion. I, I support you. I'm grateful for what you're doing, you know, whatever. I see you. And then they become much more sensitive about how they communicate with you. This transforms relationships. Well, that actually leads us perfectly into my next question, which you, you did touch on a little bit, which is what can people do if they want to improve their personal relationships and also help create a more relational world? So, so that you're right. I mean, that does speak to your last question. And I would, I would also come back to, you know, committing to building relational literacy, you know, it's, and the thing about relational literacy is that you can build it like every interaction you have is an opportunity to practice relational literacy and to build relational literacy, whether you're paying for your groceries, you know, or filling your, your tank at the gas station, talking to somebody, or you're talking to your loved ones about veganism and, you know, eating animals, um, or you're on a stage giving a talk, like these are all opportunities. And, um, it's, it's not rocket science. Um, it's not, Building relational literacy is not rocket science, and it can be so transformational. And the more we do it, like it doesn't matter what area of life you build relational literacy in, it will spill into other areas of your life. You know, when you build relational literacy because you want to be a better partner, you know, this will help you also be a better, a healthier consumer in some ways. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we're going to turn over to uh, to the audience for a Q and A for about 30 minutes. So, how do you respond to people who argue that it's natural for humans to consume meat, and it's you know a part of our evolutionary history? How how would you take that on, or how should how should you suggest that others 
take on that question? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, what I say often is I'll say, you know, I know I used to believe that it was natural for people to eat meat as well. And it's it's actually true that, you know, humans have been eating meat and, you know, as a part of an omnivorous diet for, I don't know, thousands of years now. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, humans have also been like raping other humans and murdering other humans for just as long. And, you know, we have to be really careful not to conflate natural and justifiable. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of other things that I could say to that, but, you know, I say, just have to be careful. You know, when we look at, um, you know, a lot of things that we would all agree, practices that that we would all agree are practices we don't want to continue and perpetuate today. Um, they were justified based on, you know, the practice being natural. I mean, Nazis said this, um, you know, people be, be careful with that word, but like, you know, you can look back toward any, to any genocidal, uh, you know, ideology, and they probably used the argument that doing so was natural, that it was normal, natural, and necessary, actually. So I would just share, you know, natural, how we define natural is, you know, it's often changing and, and generally it's defined, you know, by we decide what's natural um, based on our cultural norms. You know, we we look at um, science, which is where we get our definition of natural from. We tend to look at science through the lens of carnism, right? So we're looking at carnistic science and, you know, it's natural because what? Because we've always been doing this. We haven't always been eating animals. Like the, the, our earliest ancestors were actually fruitarians. And then we evolved to be scavengers, you know? So when we look at history and science through the lens of carnism, we only look as far back as we need to in order to justify our current carnistic practices. But I would just, you know, I say, it's true that we've been doing this for a long time, whether that makes it natural or not, you know, it's that's an interesting question. There are other things we've been doing for just as long that, you know, we probably would agree that are not worth continuing today, that we don't want to continue today. Excellent. Uh, really great interview. Now I'm going to uh, open up for the audience for the Q&A. But before we do that, um, we'd like for everyone to know how to connect with you and find your your number of books that you have. Yeah, sure. Um, you can visit carnism.org. That's my organization is Beyond Carnism. Um, so you can visit carnism.org. And um, one of our, our main programs is uh, we have a lot of like videos and, you know, a lot of tools on that, on, on that website. And one of our main programs is our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. And um, the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy is um, you can get linked through carnism.org as well. Or you can go to veganadvocacy.org. Mm. And uh, we have a lot of courses on, you know, how to communicate about the issue, for example, about, about veganism, uh, what, what the science shows were evidence-based outreach communication strategies. Um, we are, we really see ourselves as a support organization. We are in support of people who are doing this incredibly important work of, you know, raising awareness of, of the problems inherent in agro animal agriculture and and working to change that. So you have lot, lots and lots of, of free resources. Okay, great. And then we also have the, the books available through the realtruthabouthealth.com uh, website as well. Great. So, um, okay. So with that, I just want to kind of uh, educate the audience on how we're going to go about the Q&A. We are not going to take questions um, from our chat directly. What we are going to do is have people raise their hand in the uh, uh, in Zoom, and what uh, if you don't know how to do that already? What you need to do is go to the bottom of your Zoom window, mm -hmm. and on the bottom right side, uh, I believe it's second to the last item, is a, a button called Reactions. You're going to click on that, and you'll click on the Raise Hand function in that pop up menu. When, um, when we're going to take the questions in the order in which people are queued up in the participant window. Um, when it's your turn, we will unmute you and prompt you to state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. We will then mute you afterwards. So um, please make your question brief and on topic. You know, everyone here, you know, all of our speakers have different expertise. So please make it relevant to the particular, uh, to the particular speaker. And in order to give everyone a chance to get their, uh, their question answered, uh, we won't be taking follow-up questions. So um, if you, if you, if there is time in the Q and A and you have another question, you can get back online though. 
So uh, with that, we're going to open it up. And our first person is Bonnie. So Bonnie, go ahead and state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, my name is Bonnie Martin. I'm from Bowie, Maryland. And that was very informative. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a comment that I've never, as a vegan, I've never watched terrific images of animals. And I don't think people should pass that on either. I just think it's too traumatizing. But my question was, or comment, when you were talking about um, sharing your truth at the table uh, with someone that's non-vegan, what I have found, or my experience has been by the fact that I am vegan causes conflict. I don't have to say anything because- right. The fact that you're saying, well, I don't like looking at carcasses. This is why. What are you implying about the other person? Even though you may not be implying that, what you're telling them, or at least I, I found, is that, well, then you must think it's, I must, you must think that I think it's okay to abuse animals and I don't care. Yeah, I'm so glad that you um, shared this information. Thank you so much. Um, so, so a couple of things. You are 100% right. right. I agree with you 100%. Um, I do not actually advocate talking about eating animals at the dinner table. Um, the author, Carol Adams, says actually it's like the worst time to have the conversation because people are in the process of doing something that they're going to be even more defensive against doing so. Um, it's better if somebody says, for example, why are you vegan? Or they want to talk to you about veganism to, and it happens to be during dinner to, to ask to say, well, you know, let's, why don't we, you know, not talk about a topic like this right now. We can have a chat about this after we're done eating. So, um, Absolutely. I also don't recommend in general that people use terms like carcasses or like dead animals, things like that, because they can be, these can be triggering. These are like, I call them allergen words. You know, they're words that people tend to have an allergic reaction to and, you know, can cause people to feel very, very defensive. So you're spot on about that. Um, I was responding to a question about, or actually it was a scenario about a vegan potentially being teased at the dinner table for being vegan for having asked for the turkey to be removed um, from the table, which is a little bit different. But, you know, all of these, this is sort of the problem. There's no one size fits all um, approach. And in terms of like not witnessing graphic imagery, that that's fantastic, you know, that you've been able to, to stay away from that. A lot of people cannot. Some people, you know, they're just, it, it kind of jumps out at them in their social media feeds, for example. Um, and then they, they start to, a lot of people start to feel almost compelled to keep watching. I've heard this over and over again. Many vegans have said to me, actually, I force myself to watch because I feel like it's the least I can do given what the animals are going through. And, you know, they don't realize that like watching is actually probably not good for the animals because it's making them less sustainable and more likely to burn out. So, um, yeah. So thank you for, thank you for your comment. And uh, yeah, it's very, very helpful. It gives me a, an opportunity to, to try to try to clarify. Okay, thank you. Um, our next um, question is coming from Stephen. Stephen, please state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, this is Stephen. I'm from Syosset, New York. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. I find myself um, have a lot of passionate opinions on a lot of subjects, whether it's uh, vaccinations or veganism or climate change. And a lot of people have very, very different opinions because they read and see different things. And I often find myself disconnecting and I feel disconnected, which makes me sad, but I also feel so outraged and so overwhelmed and so exasperated by what they're reading and what they're thinking. Um, and I find myself disconnected, which is really sad, but at the same time, I don't want to pretend that everything is okay. Um, how can I be effective in this world and also stay connected to people? Wow, that's an incredible question. I'll do my best to try to answer it. Um, I talk about this a little bit in Beyond Beliefs, um, where, you know, it's really, I think, so first of all, it, it makes sense, especially if you're a person who's passionate and you're, you're passionate about your opinions, you know, you're, it's going to be difficult for you to feel a genuine connection with people who don't share your opinions. And so, um, you know, and it sounds like it's more than your opinions. It's, this sounds like what you're saying is more about values, you know, where, where you need people who are values aligned. And, um, 
you know, it's a matter of that some pe people are very different. You know, we have very different personalities and some people have personalities such that they can feel quite connected with people who are very different in some fairly substantial ways. Other people, not so much. And so, you know, you you sound like you're a person who really needs more value to align to people to be close to. And one thing you can do is just sort of think about people, the people in your life in concentric circles. So you've got your core inner circle of people, and then you've got the circle outside of that where, I don't know, that might be kind of like friend, you know, close-ish friends and colleagues, and then a circle outside of that, which is more acquaintances, and then a circle outside of that, which maybe that's everybody else. In general, people need to have the people who are closest to them more aligned with their values. And as they get further out, you know, the value alignment or opinion alignment, you know, becomes less and less important to them. And it might be about, you know, you determining who is it? Like, who is it that really, that I really need to feel value aligned with in my life? And if those people aren't value aligned with you, then that's an interesting, an interesting sort of conundrum to deal with. People can stretch across these differences and feel connected enough. I mean, most people in relationships, it's not that they feel connected or disconnected. They feel more or less connected. And, you know, what do you need? You can ask yourself, what do I need in order to feel connected enough with this person? So just as an example, um, you know, I have, uh, I have in my family people who are meat eaters and I have like my, my, my uncle is a, a hunter and I don't spend lots of time with him. He doesn't live close to me, but I, I do love him and I do feel a connection with him. And when I in interact with him, I'm able to feel quite connected with him. And, and this is because I, he's not so close that I have to have somebody who's totally valued or very values aligned. And at the same time, um, I'm able to separate his behavior from who he is on a deeper level. And this might be something that you can try to apply. You know, a lot of what causes disconnection is this feeling inside of us that this other person is a bad person, or it's impossible for me to respect this person because of what they do. But when you can separate the behavior from the person, that creates a bit of space in the relationship for you, um, that can create a bit of space in the relationship. Recognizing the truth that all of us, you know, from a psychological perspective, this is just the reality. Each and every one of us is nothing more nor less than the genetics and hard wiring that we were born with and every single experience we've had throughout our lives. That's who we are. That's what makes us who we are. So if I were born into my uncle's genetics and had his experiences, I'd be a hunter. And I know that, right? So, so that creates space in relationships. And, you know, somebody's writing in a chat, stay away from hot topics. You know, this, this is another really important point. Um, it may be, you know, for you that that a key strategy is is really just having an agreement not to talk about the things that you're in disagreement with, um, because otherwise it's just going to be it'll be just much too charged. And when you can relate to the people in your life and not have an agenda to change them in some way, it creates a lot of space and wiggle room in that relationship for people to be able to connect in, in other ways. Thank you. Um, so we we don't currently have any more audience questions. So I'm going to ask if anybody in the audience has any more questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. Again, if you don't know how to do it, on the bottom right-hand side of Zoom, you'll see the, the reactions button. You're going to click on that and click on the raise hand button, and then I will call on you in the order. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have a question for you, or, or I just want to get your thoughts on this. So one thing that I find people tend to know that I'm vegan. I'm, I'm not a particularly shy person, but I, I never try to persuade people. But what I find happening is people without me saying anything, maybe just like they'll see me order and it'll come up that I'm, that I'm vegan. will start, you know, saying, how, you know, apologizing or start telling me how they love animal. And without me, you know, I'm not trying to make them feel bad. Like I, I, you know, a lot of what you said kind of resonates with what I try to do anyway. Um, but they'll they'll kind of be like, oh, you know, I, I really don't eat meat that often and this and that. W what do you think is going on with that? You know, with uh, their psychology? Is it just guilt? Is it 
you know? Well, I mean, I'm not a mind reader, so I don't sure. know. Um, but I would say people have different reactions, right? Some people say, I think the other, I think it was Bonnie who who talked and says, I, I don't even, I don't have to say anything. Just knowing that I'm vegan, you know, kind of makes this like, you know, people sometimes just hear that you're vegan and immediately they start relating to you in a certain way. Like very often, you know, vegans are such a small percentage of the population, it's very easy to stereotype people who are not represented in complex ways in the dominant culture, the mainstream culture. So a lot of people think a vegan is a vegan and all vegans are the same. And, you know, they stare at, here you go, the vegan, you know, what does that mean? Um, but, you know, often people will say like, not not say anything and you find somebody finds out you're a vegan and then they'll come up to you at a party or whatever and start telling you all the reasons you're wrong for your own ideology when they didn't even know what vegan meant for that party you know it's just it's incredible the the gamut you know the conversation runs and and these days as i said you know earlier as awareness of veganism is is growing and more and more people are becoming ethically uncomfortable participating in carnism um, you know, there is like this cognitive dissonance, cognitive dissonance, and, and we know this anyway, cognitive dissonance is the internal discomfort that we feel when our values and our behaviors are not in alignment. And, you know, the vast majority of people genuinely do not believe that it is acceptable or appropriate to treat other living beings in the way that they are treated when they're turned into food for us, you know. Carnism is completely antithetical to the core values that the vast majority of us carry around. And so, you know, when people have cognitive dissonance, that creates an internal discomfort, a guilt. And so, which makes sense. And we all have cognitive dissonance because we all participate in various atrocities in different ways. You can't, you can't even avoid it, um, you know, in this day and age. So it, you do hear this sort of like apologetic kind of commentary sometimes, mm. you know, and I see this as a really good thing because, you know, like I said to you earlier, um, for me, it's like, you know, having gone from the eighties when I went vegetarian you know, and then vegan in like 90 or something where people were just like, I mean, that was really harsh. And now it's generally when people find out I'm vegan, it's complimentary. Right. Excellent. Excellent. So we have another question. It is from, Kaylee, Kaylee, please state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Um, Kaylee Covington from uh, Plainview South at New York. Um, when you, okay, I feel like my purpose in life, the reason I was born, is to do everything I could to make sure that this planet continues in such a way that 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 it is treating everybody, every animal, every plant, the earth with respect. And that I love art. I did a lot of music. I, I love supporting the different things that are going on around me. That There are so many things that contribute to everything else that is happening on the planet. And it seems like um, what we eat is if, if that was actually fully solved that and and along with that was the 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 I can it's beyond belief that every every living being deserves to be respected and treated with love. Um, where do you start? And I I have difficulty prioritizing. I'm trying to support so many different things and and, and it feels so urgent. It feels to me, and maybe it, it's just my how I hold it, that that we don't have much time left. The planet doesn't need us, and we need the planet. Um, I, I don't know how to hold that, and I'm trying very hard to be um, to, to to function as effectively as possible. And I don't know where to start. Thank you, Kaylee. What what? Please, anything your thoughts are, I appreciate. What a great, you know, um, yeah, what a great question. And thank you, you know, your, your caring and compassion. It's just so palpable. And it's, it moves me, it moves me to hear you share and to, to hear, you know, all of this caring in your heart and the motivation you have. And, um, and, you know, I also want to just just say that like your emotion, you know, this feeling that you have, this feeling of urgency, you know, it makes sense. 
this feeling of despair and sadness it makes sense. These are like very normal emotional responses when you have empathy and you're awake to the atrocity that we're, you know, in the midst of right now, multiple atrocities. Um, and the question is really important because very often, you know, we ask, our, we, we just kind of like do whatever we can do, whatever feels right to us to try to end the suffering. But like, you know, it's not always effective. When you're effective, you know, you can do a lot more. And, and that's the, one of the most important questions for us to ask. So to answer that question, a um, couple of things. Um, there's a website called 80,000 Hours. And I believe on that website, well, they talk about careers. I don't know that you're looking for a new career, but careers that are, are high impact careers. Um, if you come to our website, the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, um, we have a lot of information there about what's called effective altruism. You can also just Google effective altruism yourself. And I, I don't remember the main website for it, but it's... Uh, I don't remember the, the name of their website, but effective altruism is basically it's a movement and it's a pro, an approach to creating social change. And what effective altruism altruism seeks to do, or effective altruists seek to do, is to sort of crack the code of what the most effective way to bring about a certain type of change is. I can't answer the question for you because it really depends on your circumstances, right? So some people. Uh, you know, some people that you, you that use their influence in whatever way they can. Journalists write about issues, you know, some people are donors, some of, you know, they, they donate to, to highly effective organizations um, to help those organizations operate more effectively. And this can be an incredibly powerful way to, to further this work. Um, and it's, it's really, there are a set of questions you can ask, you know, what is your skill set? What are your means? What is your interest area? And then with, with ineffective altruism, they, they talk about here are the big issues in the world. They look at like the big issues in the world that are the most pressing issues. And, you know, animal suffering is one of those, which is great, you know, and here are the gaps. This is really where the need is. And this is where, you know, effective strategies come in. So I would would recommend I can't answer your question directly because I don't know your situation but um you can do some research look into effective altruism come to our website center for effective vegan advocacy um and then there are also sites to help you look for organizations to support that are doing effective work you know you can decide that determine that yourself as well um to further the work like you don't have to create something new support the people who are doing the work and and who are doing it well Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions just along the lines of like how people can communicate on certain topics, right? I, I, I'm not going to ask you specifically about, um, you know, you know, the, the, whether it's right or wrong, or whatever, but but really how do vegans communicate? So, you know, to, to non-vegans on this, for example, um, you know, a lot of people will, will talk about, uh, you know, factory farming and, and with all of its ugliness, they'll talk about how it's necessary in order to meet global food demand. How, how should a, you know, somebody who effectively wants to communicate and open someone's mind as opposed to just preach to somebody, how should they go about communicating um, their, their thoughts on that topic? I mean, that's a big, that's, that's a good question. It's a really big question. I'll have, I'll probably have time for maybe one more question after this, Perfect. just a heads up. Um, so um I, it's funny, I rarely get that response from people, but I can imagine that that is, or that that question from people, I can imagine that's a fairly common question. I would, so so with, with comments like that, um, I would actually respond by asking questions, you know, because somebody who says that probably doesn't actually understand how the food system, which is a highly complex system, actually operates. Um, and then when you come at them with questions, you kind of like, you hold them accountable because a lot of times what we hear is like just defensive questions that are really defenses, questions that are not meant to open up a conversation and find a solution, but rather to defend carnism. And that that is one of them. Right. So why do you say that? How do you know that? And then, you know, as they answer, keep asking questions so that you yourself can really get you know, a clear picture of what they're actually trying to communicate to you. And, you know, most people would would not, um, 
you know, sometimes what I do also is I bring in the golden retriever example. And I say, you know, after asking questions, I might say, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, for me now, I used to feel the same way. And I always, you know, communicate through my story. But like I said, nobody can make your story wrong. I used to feel this way too. I really understand where you're coming from. You know, since I've learned about the global food system and, you know, in particular, in particular, since I've learned about what happens to the environment and to non-human animals, you know, under uh, the system of animal agriculture, you know, my experience has changed my opinion, my feelings, my experience has really changed dramatically. I guess the only way I could, you know, any comparison I could come up with is like, I don't know if it was like golden retrievers or something, there are dogs and cats that were in the system. It would just, you know, it, it, it just opened my mind in a completely different way. And so now the questions that I'm asking, you know, are not how can we justify the system, but how can we dismantle it so that we create a system that works for all of us and that is based on the values that we all share? You know, I often keep values out of it, actually, and, you know, just try to keep the conversation quite logical, um, you know, or, or, or in sort of more more practical. But but I might say that to somebody if I was close enough to them. OK, and I, this may be a little bit outside of your area of expertise, but um, what what are some of the environmental and social impacts of factory farming, if, if you know that? I mean, it is out of my expertise and that I can't give you statistics. You know, I, I do know that the United Nations has said that animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to some of the most serious, you know, um, uh, environmental problems facing the world today, not the least of which is, is climate change. I mean, we know animal agriculture is a leading driver of climate change. And, you know, Human Rights Watch has like criticized a single industry, um, you know, for, for being so atrocious it violates basic human rights and that was the meat industry um, because of the way meat packers uh, are treated and slaughterhouse workers are treated i i cover actually all of this in my book in uh, why we love dogs eat pigs and wear cow cows but there's a lot of great information um out there for for anybody who just quick google search will pull a lot of this up okay and with that that was our last question i want to thank you so much mm -hmm.